Good morning, church family. My name is Isaac Reff, and I am the teacher for YC3. And it's a joy today to be able to share a few minutes with you today in our devotionable, brief devotions for busy people. Our Bible reading plan has brought us to the book of Deuteronomy, chapters 1 and 2. And Deuteronomy is an important book. The three most quoted Old Testament books in the New Testament are the Psalms, Isaiah, and then Deuteronomy. Our Lord Jesus himself quoted from the book of Deuteronomy three times in the temptation in the wilderness. When Satan was tempting him, he quoted from Deuteronomy each time. Deuteronomy is anything but a book that was important only for the Israelites. Far from it. The authors of the New Testament and our Lord himself saw the significance of Deuteronomy for honoring God, and we ought to take that perspective as well. Deuteronomy is especially helpful for us as we strive to honor, honor God with its unrelenting emphasis on the law. Now, law is something of a dirty word to some Christians, and we tend to prefer the word grace much better. But in Romans, Paul says that the law is righteous and holy and good. There are three main ways as Christians we are able to use the law. First, the law is a mirror. When we read Deuteronomy, we come face to face with God's holiness and with our sinfulness. We see what God would have us do, what he has commanded us to do, and we see how we have failed to do that. The law shows us God's standard, which is simply God's own perfect character, and shows us how we have failed to keep that standard. As Paul again says in Romans 3, through the law comes the knowledge of sin. When we read the law, we realize we have sinned are in need of someone to save us from our sin. The law is a tutor, a guide to lead us to Christ, to cause us to despair of our own righteousness, but to see the perfect, spotless righteousness of Christ. The second use of the law is to restrain evil. Even unbelievers recognize that it's wrong to murder, it's wrong to steal and lie and commit adultery and all those things. And those are all commandments contained in the Ten Commandments, which were first given in Exodus, but are now going to be expounded on at length in Deuteronomy. God has graciously given humanity his law to restrain evil, to curb sin, and to promote human flourishing in the world. While there's debate about how much of the Old Testament law is meant to apply today, at the very least we can say the more a society recognizes the validity of the Ten Commandments, the greater and more prosperous and more righteous that society will be. The third use of the law is it reveals to us how we ought to live in order to please God. As you read Deuteronomy, be on the lookout for what God commands us to do. Of course, some things will be different for us as New Testament Christians than for Old Testament Israelites. We live under the new covenant of Christ, not under the old covenant of Moses. But much of it, the moral law, is still binding on us as Christians. For example, Jesus said the greatest commandment, the greatest and most important thing we can do to honor God is to love him with all of our heart, soul, and strength. I find it interesting that that command, which is in Deuteronomy chapter 6, that in Jesus' mind, that is the most important commandment for the Christian. The most important commandment for the Christian is not the great commission, but the great commandment. Now, of course, we ought to make disciples, but God does not care about our disciple-making efforts if we do not love him with everything that we are. So those are the three uses of the law. First, to convict us of sin. Second, to restrain evil. And third, to reveal how we ought to live in order to please God. Deuteronomy is preached law. It is a sermon unfolding the Ten Commandments. So as we read through Deuteronomy, be on the lookout and remember these three uses of the law. And now I just have one thing to say regarding Deuteronomy chapters 1 and 2. Moses is reviewing the history of Israel from Mount Sinai, where God first formed a covenant with Israel as a nation, to their current situation as they are standing on the plains of Moab on the other side of the Jordan, about to cross over and enter the Promised Land. We see Israel's continued sin and failure, and we see God's continued mercy and forgiveness. We also see God's justice exercised on those who did not believe him. Those 
the generation of Israelites who did not believe in God perished in the wilderness. But since we're talking about law today, I want us to notice one more thing. The keynote in the first few chapters of Deuteronomy is on God's saving acts in the history of Israel. Before we get to law, before we get to exhortations, before we get to commandments to obey and keep all these things, before we get to curses for disobedience and blessing for obedience, Moses starts with what God has done. And on the basis of what God has done for Israel, he then commands them to obey. He has delivered them from Egypt. He has preserved them during 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. He's even been with them to defeat two enemy kings, a foretaste of the deliverance to come. He has kept his word to Abraham to make him and his descendants as numerous as the stars of heaven. God's saving acts always precede our obedience. By God's own grace and omnipotent power, we have been freed from slavery to sin and slavery to death and slavery to Satan. And on the basis of that freedom, we are then commanded to obey. We are given faith in Christ and then told to live for him. We are given righteousness, eternal life, and the Holy Spirit, and then told to bear fruit. It is only after that we have received God's great, irrevocable gifts, only after that are we called to obey.